From an early age, many boys in Japan spend their days building them. Dreaming of a future where humans and robots will share the earth. Aided by today's technology, what were once fantasies are becoming life-sized realities. So fast are the advancements, engineers no longer talk about fully autonomous robots as science fiction. It's really a um, game changer for us. Whether we can control them is sparking ethical debates. If those robots kill civilians, how are you going to make those robots accountable? Machines were designed to enhance human existence, but they have also been used to damaging effect. In this cyber age, will our creations help or destroy us? I'm Steve Chow. On this episode of 101 East, we examine humankind's endless desire to innovate and question the wisdom of building advanced humanoids that could one day think and act on their own. Japan has long led the world in its obsession with technology, but it's in the field of robotics where it far outshines others. We've come to one of Tokyo's more unique spots, where people get to experience robots up close. These shows are a full-on assault on the senses, but every night they're sold out with people eager for a glimpse into a possible future where humans and robots live side by side. While it is just a show, it does raise questions. Will they fight our wars? Will they fight us? Here, though, there's always a storybook ending. People triumph. <laughs> While robots are no doubt a big presence on stage, our girls are the main characters. Just as in life, we might soon be entering an age of robots. But I believe people will always be at the center. But outside this fantasy land, will we always be the ones in charge? At Japan's Museum for Emerging Science, Debating such global issues of the future is at the heart of its mission. It's no surprise then who we find as the museum's key exhibit. This is Asimo. At 130 centimeters, he looks more like a boy in a spacesuit, but Asimo is the most advanced humanoid on Earth. Built by car manufacturer Honda, Asimo not only walks with ease, he can kick a football, dance to a beat, and even carry on three conversations at once. He's also the fastest humanoid on Earth, with a top speed of 9 kilometers an hour. But the real thing that researchers want to learn through ASIMO is if people are ready to have such advanced machines in their lives. Before an almighty humanoid comes along, we hope people can have the chance to look, to participate, and to explore their feelings towards them. That's part of what this experiment is about. In the not-too-distant future, the company says ASIMOs will be able to serve as human butlers, carrying on conversations with guests and even preparing drinks and a meal. 
From the initial phase of development, we've always thought about creating a robot that can coexist with us and help us. It will take time to realize our dream, but we think we've made definite progress in its evolution. But for a robot that's cost millions and taken three decades to develop, its usefulness has been questioned. On March 11, 2011, a massive earthquake led to a devastating tsunami. The Fukushima nuclear plant was hit. Robots were desperately needed to enter radioactive areas, but none in Japan proved capable, putting human lives at risk. In the end, robots from the US and Europe were called in. To Honda's engineers, it was a moral blow. It is important that robots go into and work in places where people cannot go. Regrettably, Asamo was not made for such a scenario, so we could not deploy them. But today, a new robot is restoring the country's reputation, built by a small Japanese company called Shaft. This humanoid at a U.S. competition successfully navigated a Fukushima-type scenario. It had to independently climb over debris, drive to the scene, enter a radioactive site and shut off valves. At every stage, Shaft beat out the competition. NASA's robot failed to complete any task and in the end broke down. Soon after winning, Shaft was bought by Google. The American internet giant has been sweeping up robotic firms, including ones focused on making robot soldiers like these. Not only have these companies duplicated the movements of humans, but animals as well, with the express idea of using them in war. A new arms race has begun, and robots are at the heart of it. In Japan's halls of power, fears the country is losing this race, has leaders striking back with their own innovation program. I'm off to meet the person charged with creating it. How much of a priority would you say this program is for Japan's government? It's really a um, game changer for us. So it's better to know. Yuko Harayama is one of the country's leading scientific minds. She tells me the program called IMPACT aims to finance robot designers to keep them in Japan. It's a competition around the world. Uh, not only within Japan, but all around the world, you are seeking for new ideas. And we like to be in the front place in this game. That's why we are creating IMPACT. Harayama acknowledges that in a country that's enshrined pacifism in its constitution, Developing anything military-related is sensitive. What exactly is IMPACT's agenda? Defense, of course, defending, protecting the society. That's the more strong direction that we are pushing ahead in our program. It was once difficult to picture a world where automated killer machines would be used to wage wars. But today, drones regularly fly over countries like Afghanistan. And while humans are still behind the controls, there are newer models that can independently choose their targets. And firing. Oh, hell no. Hollywood has long warned that robot armies could one day threaten us. Experts say it's now no longer a question of if it will happen, but when. In response, rights groups are launching a preemptive strike, calling for a complete ban on lethal autonomous weapon systems. Usually, a human rights watch starts to work on those uh, weapons when you know, it starts to kill innocent you know, civilians. But uh, this is such an important issue, so we started to work in advance of seeing you know, people being killed. 
Human Rights Watch says once we give up control to our mechanical creations, it will not only undermine international laws on how war is conducted, it will threaten all humanity. If robots or the Kira robots make decisions fully independent from human beings, who to kill, when to kill, how to kill, and then if those robots kill civilians, how are you going to make those uh, robots accountable? And then how are you going to enforce the international law? The world is taking steps to address the issue. In May, the UN convened its first ever talks to debate the use of killer robots. But it'll still be years before an agreement, if any, is made. Has the Japanese government begun discussions on how to properly use robotics, how to properly use humanoids. As a leader in robotic design, Harayama agrees Japan has a moral responsibility to think of their ethical use. We need to have this kind of debate in the coming, so, so it's not in place for the moment. But uh, if you are moving ahead, in advancement of technology, we need to have some kind of debate on the society. For now, the government says it's focused on helping Japan's inventors, like Hajime Sakamoto, who could use some of Impact's resources. He's been working out of a factory space borrowed from a friend to build fighter bots. This one is modeled on Gundam, one of the most famous comic book action figures in Japan. I used to build Gundam's plastic models back in high school. I was completely absorbed that I would forget to eat. Over the years, those memories made me think that this is how I want to live my life. While up until now, Gundam has been a fictional character in comics and animated movies, Sakamoto believes today's technology makes it possible to build such machines of war. In 2001, he left a well-paying job as an engineer and threw himself full-time into realizing this dream. With little funds, he started small. With playful mini-bots that can not only strike a pose, but perform all kinds of martial arts moves. And while the robots have won international awards, Sakamoto says they could be much more advanced. My problem is not enough money and resources. You need money to build bigger robots, to buy parts. I work with these limitations. Sakamoto is seeking financial help to speed up his next big challenge, a four-meter giant. After this four-meter robot is completed, I'm thinking about taking on an eight-meter one. And after that, an 18-meter one, which is the same size as the real Gundam in the comics. In the comic books, the mechanized machine is used to battle other human civilizations. I step in for a test run. Yes, <laughs> While the movements are still somewhat awkward, Dr. Sakamoto says he's improving the design by the day, and you can foresee a time when militaries around the world will be seeking this kind of technology. Sakamoto says he would prefer to have his creations used to entertain rather than to wage battles. But he believes the way the world is moving, he won't have a choice. If others come and attack us with robots, it would mean we would have to defend ourselves with flesh and blood. That will be a problem. I'm against war, but if technology advances like it is, it's inevitable that we have to keep up with it. The first robots ever designed were created not for warfare, but simply to amuse. 
crafted 300 years ago in an art form called karakuri. They were meticulously fashioned out of wood. Shobei Tamaya continues the tradition today. In the beginning, karakuris performed on a stage. They could blow a dart, do a handstand, or strike a drum. They were like magic. Karakuri showed off a craftsman's skills. I don't think it ever crossed their mind that in the future they would be used for war. Tamaya shows us a mechanical puppet that with an intricate array of gears and pulleys can fire arrows, although not lethal ones. This puppet can deliver a cup of tea to a guest. Life-sized ones were also built. But Tamaya says craftsmen went out of their way not to scare the public, including by making their robots look like children. Lives are precious. If robots are being made as weapons, I do want to believe that at least they're made based on the thought that human lives are important. As with his forefathers, Tamaya believes robots do have a place in society, serving and entertaining people. One place where robots have served people rather well are in factories. And at this one north of Tokyo, managers are bringing the relationship between man and machine to a new level. Every morning, both join each other for a warm-up exercise. Then it's onto the assembly line. In 2011, the factory which makes coin counters brought in humanoid robots because it believed their shape would make their human employees more comfortable around automated machines. While they look a bit ominous to a first-time observer like myself, employees say they've grown to like them. I think they are, in a way, like a person. They seem to have acquired the senses to do delicate works, just like humans remember how to do them. I think it's amazing. The factory keeps robots on the same eight-hour shifts as every other employee. And even while newer models with improved dexterity could replace humans here, factory bosses refuse to saying they believe people should always be the most valued of beings. Proof their approach works, they say, is the fact that efficiency is high among all staff and profits are soaring. It was beyond our imagination that the collaboration between people and humanoids could develop so far. The key is to place people and robots in specialized roles, and then you get great automation. Just down the road, another company is also proving that machines can be used to better humankind. Four years ago, Toshio Nakakita damaged his spine when he fell off his bike. He began visiting a company called Cyberdyne, which builds exoskeletons that help strengthen damaged muscles and nerves. The robotic legs not only support weight, they seamlessly follow a body's natural movements. Today, Toshio feels stronger than ever. You could say he feels almost superhuman. I can say I've become more powerful and appreciate this machine. In that sense, I feel I've come a bit closer to becoming an Iron Man. Well, maybe one small step closer. Okay, could you try to bend your elbow? Okay. Let me flex. Yes, and extend. And then extend. Yes. We are given the chance to try this Iron Man enabling device. Well, we're told that the way this works is that this device can actually read the electric impulses that travel across the skin that triggers movement, and it can then translate that into this walking machine. Cyberdyne boasts that it is the first in the world to allow people to be truly a cyborg, part man, part robot. Besides helping the disabled, Cyberdyne says their technology can assist the elderly and allow factory workers to lift heavier loads. Militaries can also see the potential and have repeatedly asked to buy the exoskeletons, but the company has so far refused. Terminator, Cyberdyne Systems Model 101. 
Some may remember Cyberdyne in the Hollywood film series Terminator. The evil corporation helped create the intelligent killer machines that tried to wipe out human existence. Yoshiyuki Senkai, the genius behind Japan Cyberdyne, has a Terminator model in his personal collection of robots. But he says the philosophy of his company couldn't be more different. In the future, uh, I think there are two types of directions. The one is the uh, robotic technologies in the military fields. Another one is the robotic technology in the medical and well-being and life. So the one side, this side is our side. And while Sankai believes it will soon be possible for militaries to develop robots with artificial intelligence, he fears that prospect and vows never to build them himself. Humans should be centered, and the technology is always supporting the humans. That one is, a, I think, suitable relationship between the human and the technologies. Humanity already has a taste of what artificial intelligence could look like. In a packed stadium, tens of thousands of fans have come to worship the world's latest star. Miku Hatsune is a bubbly, blue-haired songstress. She's also a 3D hologram. Idolized by a legion of fans, her concerts sell out venues from Japan to the U.S. to Indonesia. Her popularity has come as a surprise to her creator, Hiroyuki Ito. I don't know why, but through Miku, people are able to share a moment with each other, even though they know the person on stage is not human. Miku was born out of a computer program. People write their own music on it, and then Miku sings it for them. Being able to interact with her has made Miku come alive to her fans, even though she is just an image generated by a machine. Ito believes that as our creations gain in intelligence, we will increasingly embrace them, regardless of whether they're human or not. When we think about real versus unreal, we constantly lose track of which is which. If music on a CD is fake, then all music is fake. And if only music played live by people is real, then there will be a very little music in the world. So in that sense, we already have embraced the unreal in our society and enjoy it. These days, it is getting harder to tell the difference between what's human and what's manufactured. Professor Hiroshi Ishiguro has created an exact robot model of himself, right down to the smallest details. He's using it to see into the future and find out how far our relationship with machines will go. Probably, I think the android will be a kind of human, the partner of humans, or a kind of maybe, you know, almost the same as humans. It is not perfectly the same as humans, but a human society, I guess, never distinguish which is which. Ishiguro envisions androids as one day being our friends, our lovers, our confidants. And even though his model is controlled by someone else in a different room, he says it's easy to forget he's talking to a machine. He calls our embrace of the unreal evolution. As we develop uh, new technologies, we are changing the definition of humans. But uh, you know, today, even if the person has the artificial, the arms and the legs, right, uh, prosthetic arms and legs, you know, what, you know, of course, definitely, you know, he or she is a uh, human. Ishiguro firmly believes we could end up creating artificially intelligent machines that will one day take over or destroy us. But even with that possibility, he doesn't think we can stop ourselves. It's quite difficult to limit 
the, the level of intelligence of a robot. Because we always we want to be more clever, we want to have more better intelligence. So once we create the, that kind of and the uh, computers, we just create a much better one, a much better one. Never stop. Ishiguro says we only have to look at the pace of robot development for proof of how quickly our world is changing. And while there are many examples of inventors focused on building for good, there are just as many individuals or private firms competing for technological supremacy on future battlefields. He and other futurologists believe humans should try and answer the question of how we will use and control our designs. Because at some point, he says, it will become too late to shut our creations off. <laughs>